I was a punk in 76 when I was 15. I lived in London's East End. As well as being a punk, watching the famous punk bands that you've all seen in other documentaries, I also became part of a band called Rubella Ballet. I met a lot of people and had a brilliant time as a punk. This is punk. These are my mates and this is cool, she's a punk rocker. I was wanting to know, having been through the hippie a hippie movement, what was going to happen next. And um, I remember saying at the Home Office, you know, kind of banging my fist on the table, saying to them, look, you know, you haven't um, taken any notice of us, and we've come to you with peace and love, and Gandhi-esque ideas of civil disobedience, um, and with flowers, you know, if you don't take any notice of us, what's going to happen next is going to be much more aggressive. So I was kind of waiting to see what would happen next. You know, what, what was the next generation of youth going to do? Punk! I'm a punk rocker. I wanted people to look at me and go, what the bloody hell is all that about? All hell broke loose, basically. Everyone suddenly knew who punks were. And uh, we were public enemy number one. Everyone was trying to attack us, shout at us in the street, going, oh, look, you dirty punk rockers. Look, she's a punk rocker. Well, I was a punk at the time, but I didn't know it. So I called it punk rock. beginning we sort of had our own sort of version of punk and our own scene in the New Kings Road. It was small but it was fun. Well I was brought up in World's End so I kind of saw the whole thing unfold and at the time you know a friend of mine used to work in both of my and I just went in there and you know that's when I met Polly. She had a little store there and stuff. Because I was selling lots of plastic layers so then I used the name polystyrene um, for my stage name. Well, I was a punk at the time, but I didn't know it. Do you see what I mean? It was like, I, I had my own style. We used to go to Beaufort Market, and there was lots of people in there. One of the people, I think, that was in there was polystyrene selling her clothes in her shop. And then when I saw, you know, her stuff, it was completely different than the kind of stuff I was wearing. But I thought, wow, you know, there's a load of people that are kind of the same as me. Because at the time, it's like, it just seemed like a whole generation was just, or individuals in a generation, just wanted to, we all kind of had the same idea, and somehow or other it was like a magnet. We were brought together, and it was a really amazing time, actually. 
suddenly discovering there was something about people that I could relate to and then we all became this community and see punk wasn't actually put as a label until about see punk started about 75 the label wasn't really given to us about summer 76 late 76 so we didn't know we were punks we just knew we were different my mum went mad you know I started off just shaving my head almost it was almost skinhead and um, I had me ear pierced and my mum went ape <laughs> it was like ah reaction here I am you know I was about 12 and I went on holiday with a group of really sort of trendy arty friends who were all punks and starting to turn into punks and it happened in one summer and suddenly from going from a like little classical snob who hated pop music I turned into this sort of nasty punk rocker. <laughs> I'd be awesome. I became involved in punk in 1970 six and I got a job at the New Musical Express when I was 17 years old. It was just like yes yeah, so the way of taking the piss out of the Jubilee was wearing Ariel put her knickers over her tights. We started to dress differently ourselves and because we were making our own clothes we couldn't actually afford to keep up all the time. We'd sort of make things out of the clothes that we bought in second-hand shops. They were different. They were saying what they wanted to say. They weren't afraid to say it. Um, they were dressed in a way which was then just wearing straight trousers and the hair spiked up and looking slightly scruffy and it was just really good and it was their own look. To me it was the first time I'd seen this look. There was a photo in a paper with me with a t-shirt saying fuck off. That night I got a pair of old trousers, took them in by hand and put safety pins. I went down to the chemist, bought a packet of gold safety pins, stuck them all down my leg and uh, Put a white shirt with my dad and wrote silly things all over it, punk and things, I suppose, something really silly, you know. Bored my dad's time, went to school like that the next day, and that was it. We were always different anyway. I mean, like, we dressed um, slightly different, more on the avant garde disco scene, like pegs and plastic sandals before punk came out. And I saw this girl who I might think must be Susie at Charing Cross Station at really early 76, and she had a safety pin through her ear. I didn't even know what punk was, and I thought, brilliant idea, and then crushed. Mm -hmm. So I rushed off home, got the safety pins in, so I was wearing safety pins before I even knew what punk was. At that time, it was just things like having your shirt hanging out of your trousers, which probably seems like no big deal now at all. But that was a, a punk thing. You wouldn't walk around in, in the 70s with your shirt hanging out of your trousers, and, and you know, women wouldn't have a tie on them and things. So that, you could, I could wear that on the way to school, and when I got to school, I just tucked my shirt in. You know, they would literally paint the news onto their T-shirts that day, um, and so you, 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 you became part of the news, part of the progress with your artwork, with your music. And um, I think I mean the, the women in punk were doing that too. I mean that the very that their style was um, a demonstration in visual art about what they were, where they were at, and what they believed in. The thing is about punk, and unless people were around at the beginning of punk to see it, I don't think people realise how, if you saw me as a punk then, today, I wouldn't stand out because fashion's changed so much and what people wear now is what we used to be called punks in. And it was basically just wearing straight trousers, um, safety pins, maybe a couple of zips, zips were everywhere, you just sewed zips all over your legs, a shirt that you put your own graffiti on and names of bands, a tie, we were all designing our own clothes and wearing our own clothes. And instead of the fashion industry telling us what to wear, we told them what to wear. I used to go out and see the punks. I used to think, wow, they look great. And I was working in a really straight job with horses. And uh, I thought that they looked fantastic, but the people I worked for used to go mad. If I just put a pink rinse on, they'd go, oh my God, I hope it washed out by the time we go to Royal Windsor. Dyed my hair white. Well, I was blonde at the time, I knew, but I dyed it really white. And I just put this, we see Billy Idol, see how his hair was. I mean, that was my hair and the boy stole my look. Well, he didn't actually, no offense, Billy, but he just, he said to me one day, we were at a party and he said he had like his blonde hair like this, but it was kind of down. And he said, well, how do you get your hair like that? And I said, put a bit of Vaseline in. And the next time we saw him gig and that was it, that was his look. That tough look that, um, that women began to wear in the punk style, for me, was incredibly liberating.
what the hippie chick was meant to do was sit at home um, and embroider the tears in jeans. And the, the, the uh, and so you know the, the embroidered jeans was kind of one of the icons or symbols of the hippie movement. What was so absolutely fantastic was in the punk movement, you didn't have to embroider jeans. You didn't have to do any sewing at all. You used safety pins and you know, the rips were okay. I mean, it was that these little, you know, to me, that was just, it was just fantastic. In those days, you couldn't buy punk records. No one had ever even heard of punk. If you saw another punk, you'd just stop and talk, which is how you met other punks, which you were saying about how do you meet people. And Dan, local youth clubs, I mean, it was just, you just identified, if you saw punks went there, then you went there, you know. And that's how you got to meet other punks, and that's how you got to find out about clubs and places to go. It was really, really at the beginning of punk, wasn't it? And then it was about going to see the other bands play so we'd get all the tickets for free for the music machine we might pay for the friday night or the saturday night but then we'd get lots of free tickets for during the week and i think i can't really remember the names of the bands now but they were like the first punk bands they were bands that, that you didn't really know who you were going to see till you got there yeah then i started going to gigs that was it Marion kind of introduced me to that punk scene in london at the time so we used to go to the roxy all the time and Voltex and the hundred club and you know. It was just pure partying, I suppose, all the time. Yeah, there wasn't much about punk anyway, really. Nobody knew about punk except for um, the music press wrote a little bit about the Sex Pistols. What was the word that I could use to distinguish this kind of music from pub, pub rock or stadium rock or rock and roll? So I called it punk rock. We're just born teenagers. It wasn't the best time to be in a band if you know, if you didn't want to be spat at, for example, that you know, doing long tours and things, and always being covered in gob was, you know, <laughs> no fun at all. Um, I think we were spat at <laughs> because the press um, it used to say, and their fans adore them by spitting at them. This is how they show their appreciation, and they didn't actually until they wrote it and all the kids came along and thought, oh, this is how we're going to do it. So it was like, it's a nightmare, sort of like going on stage and sort of coming off all this gun tube and gob. And uh, we used to wear, sort of, well, I used to wear a lot of plastic, sort of protective clothing. In 1979, we played a gig at the Theatre Royal Stratford and um, it was invaded by a skinhead before we even went on stage. We were playing with Poison Girls. Skinheads were there and they were sort of being a bit loud, abusive, shouting things, but not too bad. And then one of them spat at me and I stopped and sort of had a go at him and he got on stage and apologised to me in front of all of the skinheads. He was saying, sorry I spat at you, which was just as well because I was about to punch his face in. We play, because of all the media attention, when we played, we get people coming up being very, very aggressive, like throwing lager over you and stuff like that. I remember I hit one guy over the head in Wales in Cardiff with my microphone stand so he threw a pint of lager over me. Yeah well I kind of became her bodyguard. I was like you know we became really good friends like sisters and but also I was her bodyguard you know what I mean it's like not that she really needed a bodyguard but I mean to be quite honest as well I was ready that if I needed to I could have actually put somebody on the floor if I needed to and I did kind of give off that vibe. But uh, I never really had to do that because, you know, you could actually laugh off lots of situations. Well, I saw the Sex Pistols on Hastings Pier when I was about 18, actually on my 18th birthday. And they weren't famous and I just was curious to see who the Sex Pistols were. There was a sign outside. Well, we moved to London in uh, 1976 and it's just kind of happening then. So it's just sort of really tied in. We came up, moved to Hammersmith and the Pistols just started doing gigs and stranglers and everything. So it was great. We just 
kept going to gigs all the time, it's brilliant. Obviously we were searching for something and then when the pistols came, it was there. That's what we were searching for, that was what was happening. So it was like, thank you. When Johnny Rotten and that crowd came on the scene, it was like a breath of fresh air to begin with because uh, the music scene at the time was pretty crappy and there wasn't anything I was particularly interested in. It was all commercial shit, really. I have a bit of a blur now. I can't remember which, which Pistols gig was which. I, the one I particularly remember actually is um, when they played the Screen on the Green in Islington. Because I actually went to that one on my own. Tim was down in Devon, so. And it was the Pistols and the Clash and the Buzzcocks. Brilliant Bill, you know, I can't miss that. So. I went up there. And Paul Cook saying, uh, you know, you know, I'll keep an eye on you, you know, you're on your own, but well, I don't know. You would go and see the Sex Pistols and it was so genuinely exciting, you would think, oh, after this, of course, we'll be stopping off at Buckingham Palace and cut their heads off. Gigs were interesting in the sense that uh, initially I got the feeling that the aggression was quite theatrical. Um, and in the very early d days of punk, that that, um, uh, you know, that, that, that power and the, that the anger was on stage, being angry as a... Uh, a creative expression. Um, but that began to be misunderstood and by about 1978 and 79 there, there were other punks that actually thought the aggression was for real and the gigs get, began to be quite hair-raising because there were other people joining the party who were actually coming there to fight. When I was a little bit older, about 14, 15, um, I was very much into a few of us at the time were in things like the anti-Nazi League and Rock Against Racism, which was sort of mixed up with the, the gigs and, you know, to do with being a punk as well, I think. And also, um, I can remember at gigs, actually, that, that just isn't there now at all. There was a big, you know, are the National Front skinheads going to invade and, you know, smash everything on the stage and all that stuff. I can remember that going on, which people who were in London or, or people who go to gigs now just don't know about it, never, you know, don't know what you're talking about. There was the definite, you know, it's always that threat of that they might turn up or something, there's going to be a big rock or something. I think when Punk came out, it, it was probably quite different to where the media took hold of it because obviously it's in their interest to make it as sensational as possible to sell newspapers. So. I mean, it's like the pistols and that Grundy thing, you know. But some idiot like trying to provoke people into swearing and stuff. It's just pathetic. Um. School was just unbearable in the sixth form. I mean, you'd walk in the common room, they'd be going, punk, punk, punk. Because by this time, the press had written about it in the summer. And it was just pathetic in the classes. It was just too much. This is highly intelligent and imaginative. Oi, punk, is what they used to call us. Yeah, I had quite a few friends that were proud that one of their mates was a punk rocker. As long as it didn't have to be them, they weren't getting the stick for it, you know. Oh yes, the first day I went to school, went to my secondary school, it was like, woo, going to big school, you know. And I turned up with sort of green lipstick on and everything, I sent you straight back home. <laughs> get that off. <laughs> Go back, put your uniform on, I couldn't get hang of it at all. You know, you really could feel there was something happening. It was like a, a bunch of young people trying to be individuals. I mean, at the time, the beginning of 77, everybody wanted, they, everybody looked very individual. You didn't go into a room with like 50 punks in there and they all looked the same. It was like 50 people looking totally different. But by the summer of 77, the whole thing escalated. I mean, you know, like thousands, hundreds of thousands of kids in the country look like we did that first, you know, like in like, the beginning of 77, the end of 76, they kind of, do you know, do you know what I'm trying to say? It's like, you know, we were the original style. The local hairdresser had a place where they shaved your head and they started shaving my head for me and I started dyeing it. And this guy, Steve, would dye my hair in his back garden. And from then on, you know, how can I do it more and more and more? So, and I just felt like I was myself for the first time, rather than sort of wearing girly clothes and, you know, floral dresses and things like that, where I always looked ridiculous. I suddenly felt I was me and I was with people who were really, you know, yeah, you can get out of it, you can get drunk, you can have it, be yourself. So that's, that's what it was all about, really. I wanted people to look at me and go, what the bloody hell is all that about? I was to read up on it, but you know, I mean, unfortunately a lot of people don't bother reading up, so they don't know what's going on. But yeah, it was like, I wanted people to think, stay in there and think. 
What the bloody hell was that? You know, the fact that we could go out and people were shocked was it's brilliant, isn't it, when you're sort of like 18 and everybody hates you, you're getting a reaction, you know, all these people, oh no, you're dangerous, you're, you're our future and the future generation, what's going to happen to society? I mean, I suppose we loved it at the time. And one bloke said to me, if that was my daughter, I'd set fire to it. The way we used to dress, mainly, um, that was provocative, wasn't it, really? Girls just wearing their blazers and fishnet tights and probably nothing much else. And, um, you know, and dog collars, girls wearing dog collars and their boyfriends escorting them on leads. <laughs> Men especially were so frightened and I would lie if I said I wasn't happy when they were frightened. I was always trying to get into fights but like the people around me were always trying to protect me because I was young, always trying to pull me away from them. I've walked down the street and men have flinched. The worst people were groups of young men walking down the street by themselves who uh, thought they could be really abusive like insulting you and calling your names. I've got blue hair, I've got a crop, I'm young, I'm live, I sh I'm female, I should be available. I am, I'm wearing a short skirt, I'm wearing a bra, I'm wearing socks and suspenders, but I've got fucking big boots at the end of my feet and I've got spikes on. And when I walk down the street, I am totally not available. I am so powerful. People in East London were disgusted. I was the biggest slag, the biggest slacker, the biggest tart, so and so, that there was. Um, male and female were like, no, nobody understood what I was doing, why was I doing that? What's the matter with you? You're a pretty girl, you could be really nice if you tried, you know. When I was on the road with the slits and walking down the streets with, um, with the slits, I mean, the, the, it was just total hostility. You know, people were just absolutely outraged that women could dare walk out in public like that, making themselves look unattractive. You know, in other words, you know, the idea that was what was very strong about punk women, you know, you know, we are on this earth, guys, to make ourselves attractive for you. You know, we're going to be beautiful for our own sex in whatever way we want. And uh, so it was this, you know, it was like, oh my God, you're so ugly, nobody's ever going to love you. It's just like this, this, this shock horror. Um, you know, you'll never get married if you look like a punk woman. And you say, well, actually, fuck you, we don't want to get married. Well, it depends who they were. Obviously, the straight blokes just couldn't handle it. And, you know, why would you want to look so awful? I think those people were brave enough to say, you know, all right, you want to call us punks? OK, we'll be punks. Ugh. <laughs> In your face, you know, that kind of thing. Remember the album cover of the slits? Where they are, you know, covering themselves up in mud and they're creeping out of the forest. You know, like these primeval beings all caked in mud. And um, the editor of The Melody Maker said, my God, I don't know why these women are being naked. They're all so ugly. So we put the noose up and then we put up all this broken glass across the top of the partition. But people said that afterwards it was bad. And then all the hippies running the enemy would go, oh, it's a really negative vibe. And then once, right, at the tutorials, they were all like off their heads on dope. And it's really stunk. Put up the windows all muffy and it was all sealed. And so we just got a bit of like amphetamines out and I like, put it out on the editor's desk and he just went berserk. And it was like, it was not just. It's like postmodern ironism. It's like modernism. It's postmodernism. It's like you, you use something and then you change it and it means something else. Wherever you went, people either took photos of you or wanted to beat you up. Why shouldn't we expose our bodies if we want to? I left my family when I was 15. I was in a squat when I was 15. I used to go and visit, you know, I mean, I was very close. That's what I'm saying, so when I knocked at the door, my mother didn't know I was coming. Wait, oh my God, who did the neighbour see you? Who saw you? We got evicted from our house, which is our, like, mansion, and we got evicted and were thrown out on the street, and there was pictures of us in the local paper, you know. No, I got um, chucked out when I was 17 by having red hair. I kind of walked past my dad in the street thinking he would recognise me because it was all spiked up and I had all my makeup on. And I always wore this hat, this beret at home, so he never saw my red hair. So I <laughs> thought he wouldn't know who I was as I walked past him in the street. <laughs> and I came back, I was going to see a gig at the moonlight that night, <laughs> and I came back home and all hell had broken loose and I had to leave like the next day. My dad wouldn't have me in the 
in the flat anymore. Um, so I left home really by force at 17. We didn't fit in because my dad had been a, a rock star and uh, not established. I got expelled from school in fact because there was something in the paper about rock stars and drugs and my dad mentioned it said Ginger Baker admits he's taken heroin and cocaine and they, they read it at the school and I was out. We opened a big squat up in King's Cross, there was a hospital and uh, that was great, we used to have pies and stuff there. And for me that was it, when I used to go up the squats in White City, I mean I came from a family that had money and I knew uh, Sarah Ferguson and I you know, was in the polo crowd, if you've read Ginny Cooper's polo, which is completely accurate and I'd known all those people. But I finally found a place like in the squats, they gobbed all over the wall, they jacked up speed, they smashed the place up, but they were my friends because they accepted me for who I was. I didn't have to pretend anything and it was fantastic. You're forced by society to be on the margin. If, you, if you're forced there, you're a victim. You choose to be on the margin, then you are the victor and you're no longer that victim. And I chose to be on the margin. So, women are always on the margins. If you're a punk, you're on the margins. If you're gay, you're on the margins. If you're black, you're on the margins. Everybody is on the margins who isn't part of that white patriarchal middle class society. I think as a woman being a punk, it was um, much better than a woman being a disco girl <laughs> in that time. Because you were actually, you felt like you was on an equal footing with the men. You weren't always, in fact, when it comes down to the at like some of the bands, most of the time they're still male dominated, but in fact, you felt on the I suppose, if you like, at the gigs on the floor, that you felt like you was equal with the blokes. I wouldn't expect to be spoken to any different because I was a woman, other than when I'm being chatted up, which is a different thing. And then there's always some blokes that go too far, and like there isn't any situation you tend to piss off, don't you? The look as well, but the people that I met were so fantastic. The people I met were so nice. And the blokes, you see, because they treated you as equals, which is the first thing, you know, you could be a mate, you could get pissed, you could do whatever you wanted, and you were treated as an equal. It wasn't like, oh, these are girls, they're not allowed to drink pints. I mean, discos, you just got treated like, well, just spare parts of discos. There's some that are all right, but I think they got better over the years, but punk scene was definitely much better and you could go to the bar and get a pint of lager and not get any comment whereas you, I wouldn't want to be I mean I used to do it in discos as well but you'd get more of a look if you had a pint in your hand because most of the girls were drinking martinis but if you went to a gig you had a pint of lager so, and it was expected so it was alright and I liked drinking lager so. No well kind of I started going to gigs when I was about 13 in my 13th year and no no one seemed to give a shit about it to be honest we used bottles of cider, smoked as many fags as we could over the weekend, you know. No, no one seemed to mind. I think because there was so much propaganda, really, about how disgusting and despicable and vermin um, that punks were, so sort of heavy, uh, thuggy type people just thought, hell, here's our chance to, we've got a, what do they call it, a scapegoat or a punch bag, really. We got chased by Ted's many a time. The run back from London to the Pistols back to Hayes. Oh, you had to go through Lewisham, which is like Teddy Boy land. You just like, you just had to run the gauntlet. We actually had to leap off at Lewisham once and hide behind dust boots. They had an excuse to be violent because these were the horror, they, you know, media wise anyway, or gutter press wise. Um, you know, these were the the vermin of society and also people had those names as well I mean you know didn't they they were calling themselves things like Tampax and you know Sid Vicious and Rat Scabers and you know they had all that and people that's strange it, it seems funny because we were kids having a laugh but it's so it seems really weird that people actually took it seriously and s saw it as something that was a threat it was, seemed to be very provocative and threatening. At punk gigs, the, the, the violence was particularly real. It's, it would be sort of ordinary people from outside that would just see it as, you know, antagonistic. Never by punks, I always felt safe if they were punks there. I think the most threatening people were always, like, kind of the straight looking people. I've always thought that sort of suburban soul boys are the most scary, violent people there are, aren't they? It was always the straight people and that time they just walked across the road and smacked the bloke in the face. We were just walking along the road. Oh, you ugly punks, you know. What's the problem? Our oh, straight seems far more violent. The punk scene wasn't violent at all really until Boys Town kind of took over. 
so I could like that clash macho look and the leather jackets and the boots and suddenly it became a uniform rather than a more open expression. I think in the punk scene um, anybody that was dressing like that kind of identified with each other so yeah you could I suppose you could just talk to people of either sex and they you know you don't you'd identify with them. It, well, it's, it's always the same like if you're, you know, if you've got something in common with people, even if now, you know, you go to a gig and, you know, you're really enjoying it and you just spontaneously start talking to people, other people, you know, about this thing you've got in common. So <clears throat> I suppose the punk thing went slightly further because there was the, the looking alike one as well, as well as just liking the same bands. And that. Me and Polly were at the 100 Club one night and poor Sid was lying totally out of his face over a table completely out of it you know heroin and we was going over to him like saying are you okay and everything and he said oh i just want to go home so i went over and i said to nancy and she's like on the dance floor and she's like giving it all up against all these other men and i just i said listen i said you know sid he's over there he's like he's practically ficking on dean on the table and i said all he wants to do is go home and she's gonna you know fuck off john savage introduced me to andy and susan that ran the roxy and then they said, would, you like, would I like to play there? So I, I played there. So I suppose when I actually played the Roxy, I was more on that scene. The first gig was at the Roxy, which was quite a nice place to do a first gig because you know, we've been going there, seeing other bands all the time. So just playing at the Roxy, it was a bit like playing in your own living room. <laughs> you know, it wasn't really sort of you know, daunting at all, just because you knew half the people in the audience. It was horrible going down the Roxy. Oh. Oh, I've never vomited in public, but that was the first time I did it. They, you, all you could drink was snake bite, which I'd never had before. I only had baby shan because I was a, a soul girl. Um, and uh, nobody told me it'd be like that. People vomited on people, and not just did people not care, but they was proud. Just see one minute you're, you're there going to see gigs, and the next minute you're actually getting paid to play there. They're great. And you're only about sort of a foot higher than you would have been in the audience. So. <laughs> Well, that was it, that was it. Then when we started playing faster and louder, because that's basically what it was about. And then it was recognising that that energy was happening even more so in other places. And it was just great. It was, that then led to, where do we play? So eventually we opened up a venue in Brighton, which was a place for us punks, which wasn't my word, uh, to rehearse and meet each other and find out what we wanted to do. And, it mates. I have to say that the slits were taught to a certain extent by their friends who were musicians and people like Mick Jones of the Clash um, was, uh, was, was, was wonderful about sharing their technique and sharing his knowledge. The reason we joined the band because it seemed like a fun thing to do. The whole scene, the whole punk thing was good. We used to watch the bands and think that was good fun and it, and it was like Anybody could suddenly be in a band, anybody, because you didn't have to have gone to a music school, you didn't have to know somebody in order to be in a band. It was just the whole idea of, of, of doing it. And we never did it to be famous or to, to make loads of money. It was just something that you could do suddenly, and suddenly it was, it was for everyone. Press had played with boys and girls, and they said to the audience, if there's anybody that wants to use our equipment, you can all get up and play. So of course the audience were all like, oh, I'll play drums, I'll play guitar. So that night, various members of the audience got up, Sid, myself, other people, other guitarists, and we just got up and jammed. And from that we thought, oh, this is good fun, we ought to get a band together. Lots of bands all helping each other, lots of screen printing, making lots of clothes. It was just very creative, a complete underground, different world, so outside of society, if you like. We all got together in the loons, which was our <laughs> female domain. And funnily enough, the same with any other place, the one place where females feel they can really be females. And that didn't change just because it was an anarchy centre. That was quite surprising. And we thought, OK, we'll be in a band. And then um, they said to us, OK, play next week with, at the time they were massive, the mob and Zams. <laughs> and we'll put you on the bill. So none of us touched an instrument. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Oh, 
I came from this sort of middle class background in a way, and Vale sort of grew up in a council flag, but you know, I was sort of trained classically on the violin and the piano, and I, I could never work out what I did on the piano if it was anything to do with punk. But gradually, after a few years, you know, I got involved with bands, and friends would say, I'll oh, come and play the violin in this band, you know, and I'd sort of go, Oh, I don't think I can. And then I'd sort of see other people just getting up who couldn't play a note, really, and getting up and just doing it. And I'd do, oh, look, you know, I'll do it then, you know, I can do it. It was fun at the gigs, but it was like a hard slog at practicing and getting the band together to do a practice. So I began doing it and also was rehearsed for a year and then I started playing gigs. came out and actually gave us those pure anarchistic sentiments. The pistols just vaguely, they talked about it, but it wasn't obvious in their lyrics. They sell us love as divinity when it's only a social obscenity. Underneath, they're all lovable. The people I was living with at this house formed part of the band Crass as well. So when the Steve and Penny go together, I came home to join them really as the visual artist for the band. Shave women collaborator! The band started and I wasn't in it, but I used to go along to gigs and the places would always empty out and I'd be like the one person pogoing in the front on my own quite often. <laughs> but I found what they were doing was. I don't know, it, it, I, found, I found it very moving what they were singing about and that they really, it, it seemed to be so felt and so meant. And I, the first thing I did with the band was um, a reading of Asylum, which was then not pressed on the first record, Feeding, feeding the 5000. And they refused to press it, so it was called The Sound of Free Speech. And then I used to perform that. And then from then on, I just got into doing songs on some which I wrote. Well, I think quite rightly they thought it was another punk band, and uh, when the band first started, it wasn't as disciplined as it became. People were drunk and on stage, and just. Uh, but I think um, you know, gradually it pulled itself together and realised, you know that. There was, it was a vehicle, a good vehicle to convey some of the dreams and aspirations that, you know, you yourself had and just sharing some of the knowledge. I believe very much in what, what we were saying and I uh, felt that it was a good way of, of saying it to quite a lot of people. A lot of women found punk a great area for exploring what they wanted to say and do and to be able to get up to the stage and be accepted more than any other. Let's put it this way, if I hadn't been doing the work I was doing, which was the studio work, I would have probably been out on the street a lot more, being an agitator. It's just the government now is so geared up to um, put you down. It's very geared up. I mean, you, you can't even protest on the streets without knowing you're going to get really clobbered. We stop, stop the city. I mean, the first two were great. We took them by surprise and we got away with, you know, really a lot of stuff. The third one, forget it. They were ready and waiting and uh, 
hurt a lot of people. Got a lot of money out of fines off of people. What's the point? Fuck them. You draw back and go underground again and come up somewhere else. I think people from the letters that we get and the people we still have coming here, people have gone underground and they're beavering away on something else, you know, and um, I think that's great. I think what we were doing was challenging male-dominated ideals. Like, you know, the very sort of obvious ones, like you know, when I came on the stage, I wasn't what was expected. The band was called Poison Girls, they thought we were all going to be girls. Just by being in a band that was predominantly female, um, we did that we'd turn up and we'd play and we'd have a following that didn't just consist of people who might think that we were attractive. Yeah, I mean, I wrote, I wrote my lyrics and I, I um, basically could do exactly what I wanted um, in that band. Uh, so for me, it was great fun. You know, I could dress how I could be wacky, dress how I wanted. Um, I could, you know, uh, sing about and just, just express myself. I think it was, it was a great sort of teenage adolescent outlet really for um, sort of creative expression really. We wrote all the lyrics and um, and all the music um, and because I think it was because we were influenced by the anarchy scene and whopping and the bands that we were hanging out with and practically everyone there was in a band um, and the fanzines and, and just that whole environment we I think we were influenced to the extent that all our lyrics did, did have a message. They weren't as obviously anti-capitalism, anti, um, anti sort of nuclear war, all the things the other bands were writing about at the time because we thought that um, so many bands had covered the same issues in the same kind of way and we wanted to try and find a different way and I think it would be fair to say that our lyrics were kind of more female oriented yeah, um, actually. they were sort of more about you know <laughs> the way inferiority of women and the way women are treated and makeup the whole spectrum yeah. <laughs> of female concerns <laughs> It's true, no future, there, there was no room for artistic development and things like that in Thatcher's Britain. Government and Parliament can make the law, police and courts can uphold the law, but a free society will only survive if we as citizens obey the law and teach our children to do so. Within punk, um, I discovered there's no class structure, there's no racism, there's no, everybody can do what they want to do. When they looked at me, they looked, not because I was a dwarf and different or whatever, they looked at me because I looked so odd. Once they had some dwarves up to promote an album and I was very angry with this because it was before PC but I was PC already and I went berserk when I saw the dwarves and I was only 17, I was just a kid but I chased them out and that was thought to be spoiling people's fun and I said it was immoral. Oh, I was always causing trouble, but they liked it, and they, because they thought that punks behaved in, in a rude, unpleasant way, they were over a, I had them over a hurdle, uh, because the more unpleasantly I behaved, the more punky they thought I was, and they were proud they had their own punk at the LME. In 1975, we'd only just got the equal opportunities for women. All of those bills were going through regarding minority groups and the way they were treated in society, so we became quite political. The Anti-Nazi League and Rock Against Racism, they started around about 1977. I remember going to see X-Ray Specs at the Anti-Nazi League gig with Shame 69 in Victoria Park. And I think there was 100,000 people. It was all about fighting racism and fighting stereotypes. So later on there was a political scene going on. It was much later on and it was in the time of when we started to watch Crass and there was anarchy bands and and began to get a bit more serious about about what punk was and about what we were doing and I think things in the world were changing a bit as well so like there was the anti-racism marches and 
the anti-Nazi league and some of the bigger bands like The Clash and uh, Blockheads and the reggae bands as would were doing these big gigs in the park and we all began to get more political and but it, it didn't stop us from being friendly to each other but then because it became political we started getting things like skinheads turning up and starting trouble at certain places. <laughs> That's a chairperson of the NCU National Women's Advisory Committee. When you was in, in that scene, because you felt it was an equal, I carried on believing that. So when I went to work, if I got any crap, I told people I weren't having it. When I was 13, 14, I started getting political and like, you know, going to women's groups and things like that as well. And I, I don't think I really quite got it, but you know, in a way it was quite good. It made me sort of conscious of a lot of things and, and fighting a lot of stereotypes at the time. Strike in Britain, very important strike of the coal miners. We wrote this song then, it's called Bill the Pinch. It's about hard time. I went on to be a trade union activist in the company and it, it was good for recruiting people as well because people knew me by saying, look out for the, the woman with the pink hair, that's the person to join the union with. I denounce the system that murders my children. I denounce the system that denies my existence. I curse the system that makes machines of my children. 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 I was energised by the punk stuff and the, and the opportunities it gave us to talk about things that were very important to me as a mother. And I think one of the things I feel proudest of writing this statement, it starts, I denounce the system that murders my children. Clause. I reject the system that to be able to say, look, this is not possibly on out loud was, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for the kind of thing. I remember when we were in the band looking at Vice Versa from the Poison Girls and just thinking, I want to be like you. I really want to be like you. I just want to have it sussed and be where you're at at your age because she epitomised age and strength and the right attitude as well, and probably still does. Yeah, last time. What's your name? Come on, come on, come on, now tell me what's your name? Oh, it's the pleasure. Oh, it's the pleasure. Oh, it's the pleasure. Oh, it's the pleasure. Certainly, um, punk um, enabled one to be um, equal in a way which I hadn't found possible before. The press got interested and it was like uh, punk mum in suburbs, blah blah. And uh, I hated that. I really hated that. I, I, I didn't like the tag mum and I suppose perhaps it was a weakness in me that I didn't take it on more positively but I felt it like accentuated the difference between us and the sort of fears that there might be between us and all that sort of parental stuff. That isn't what I was there to do. I wanted to be there as a, a person in my own right joining in the fun and making music and exchanging ideas and being where the action is. And I still do. I also had a son and a daughter and uh, I mean, it was uncomfortable I think because I did have pinkish hair and although it wasn't spiked and I didn't look like normal mums were supposed to look when they were at school and I think that was difficult for them, yeah. And there was quite a strong element of competition between us, I mean you don't want your mum. I didn't mind so much, I mean because it was like I could even take credit at my kids. Are. But from their point of view it was difficult I think. They didn't feel comfortable about it, but at the same time, they did have mixed feelings because they knew that we were sharing something and they learnt a lot and they met people of their own age and they came on tours with us and had a while of a time. We the Ballet played loads of gigs. We did a tour with Poison and Girls and Crass and we went all over Europe and America and we had a brilliant time being in a punk band because that's the thing about punk. It changed our lives because we were able to join a band, travel around the world. We wouldn't have been able to do that without punk. 
I was the keyboard player in euthanasia. We did a lot of gigs with the Bella Ballet and the singer that was my sister. And me and the drummer Pete her, had a baby, Cara, and as she got older, she was about well, as older, she was only about two, but she used to dress up in all the ballet type clothes as well and she used to love it. She used to put the ribbons in her hair and make up and you know, little girls or boys or whatever like dressing up, don't they? And she used to get on the stage with, with, with Bella Ballet and she'd just dance. My aunt's playing with Bella Ballet. I'd go up on stage and dance around that like an idiot. <laughs> I used to get dressed up like a punk myself, like my aunts would do a great job in that one. What did you want to be on the video? Punk. You want to be a punk now? I was in Bella, a couple of Rebella Ballet's videos where um, I'd get dressed up and there was, I think there's one video where we are in a dock like type place and I'm dancing around the dock. That's what's good about being a punk, it's just a right laugh and you get to do things that you wouldn't have done if you hadn't been a punk. The way punk affected my life 
was only for the good. It gave me a career when I really thought I was going to go to a factory and was well upset about that. It was a career opportunity, as it was for so many people, and it was so ironic that we were leaping about being nearless and I talk about no future, and it was a stepping stone to so much for all of us. When we were around, we couldn't buy youth culture, we made youth culture. With expression, with I felt liberated. Yeah, and it was great, and it was very fun, you know. This is the look, you know, oh, it was great. And I didn't care how, how, you know, how stupid it looked. You don't wake up in the morning, you're like, right, I'm not being a punk anymore. Sort of close her the wardrobe and say, right, I'm not punk anymore, yeah. You'll be still a punk. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't be the person I am today if it hadn't been for punk. I'm still a punk. It's <laughs> not saying, but <laughs> whenever I want to. <laughs> Proud to have been a punk and I'm still a punk at heart.